Bien, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Raimundo Pérez Hernández y tengo la suerte de ser el director de la Fundación Ramón Areces, en nombre de cuyo patronato y del Consejo Científico, hoy representado aquí por su presidente, el doctor Emilio Bouza, y por su vicepresidente, el doctor y profesor don José María Medina, les doy la más afectuosa bienvenida. Lo primero que quisiera lamentar hoy es la ausencia del profesor Carlos Centeno, quien por razones de fuerza mayor no ha podido hoy estar con nosotros y al que desde luego le deseo todo lo mejor de lo mejor. Ha sido el auténtico artífice y alma de la organización de este seminario, cuyo programa está impregnado de su profesionalidad y sabiduría. Con ocasión de una reciente visita a Pamplona, tuve la ocasión de ofrecerle la sede de la Fundación Ramoneces para que este seminario tuviera hoy aquí, consciente de lo importante del tema y de la importancia que para nosotros tiene la colaboración con la Universidad y la Clínica Navarra. El mejor ejemplo de la profesionalidad de todo este equipo es la existencia del Observatorio Global de Cuidados Paliativos Atlantes, desde luego. Un agradecimiento enorme a los participantes hoy aquí. Les agradezco que estén con nosotros en días de calor en, este, en esta ciudad. Al observatorio y, por extensión, a todo el grupo de la Clínica de la Universidad de Navarra, con quien tan estrechísima relación mantenemos y que es posible que aumente incluso en el futuro. Una bienvenida muy especial a los representantes de la Organización Mundial de la Salud, a los que tanto afecto y admiración tengo. Y lo digo no gratis de tamores, sino porque tuve el privilegio de ser embajador de España ante la Organización Mundial de la Salud desde 1996 hasta el año 2000. Pude comprobar in situ la dedicación y el entusiasmo con que los funcionarios de la OMS trataban tantos problemas sanitarios mundiales, muchos de ellos de una enorme complejidad. Recuerdo, por ejemplo, el pánico que nos entró a todos cuando el brote de la fiebre del ébola hace ya veintitantos años. También tuve la oportunidad de colaborar con la OMS en las crisis humanitarias de refugiados, cuando también tuve la suerte de ser el presidente del Comité Ejecutivo Mundial de la Cruz. Sean ustedes todos muy bienvenidos a esta casa. Quisiera excusarme, pues no todas las facilidades de la Fundación están ahora disponibles, ya que estamos ahora inmersos en un proceso de reforma de las instalaciones. Pero hemos hecho todo lo posible <coughs> perdón, para que, no obstante, tuviera lugar este simposio internacional hoy y ello por la importancia del tema de los cuidados paliativos. Estamos muy orgullosos de la colaboración que se ha establecido con el observatorio y por consecuencia de haber podido organizar, coorganizar el seminario de hoy. <coughs> la disciplina médica de los cuidados paliativos constituye probablemente uno de los campos en los que más necesario es actuar por la dimensión de las necesidades a las que se hace frente, como por el aumento espectacular de las personas que lo necesitan y que, desde luego, no todos tienen acceso, ni mucho menos, a los tratamientos requeridos. ¿Quién no conoce a alguna persona que precise o haya precisado de cuidados paliativos? Como todas las disciplinas médicas, pero esta en particular, tienen una dimensión humana, humana particularmente intensa, lo que se traduce en un entorno enormemente emotivo. Creo que el trabajo que realiza el observatorio es de una enorme utilidad y extremadamente novedoso y nos va a permitir tener una radiografía mundial de la situación en este campo. La Fundación Ramón Oreces seguirá apoyando en la medida de sus posibilidades los esfuerzos que el observatorio y la OMS realicen para mejorar la situación mundial de esta necesidad. Por último, quisiera también saludar muy especialmente al extenso grupo de personas del continente latinoamericano que se han conectado hoy. La Fundación tiene el interés y la vocación de estrechar los lazos con nuestros amigos latinoamericanos que tanto tienen que aportar. Así, por ejemplo, estamos participando en iniciativas para fomentar con ellos el papel del idioma español en la ciencia y otras muchas iniciativas. En definitiva, y termino con ello, se trata de comprometernos en apoyo de una causa noble y merecedora de obtener todos los esfuerzos. Como decía el clásico, el compromiso es un acto y no una palabra. Empecemos ya. Muchas gracias.
Muy buenas tardes. Es una gran alegría estar aquí en esta sala en Madrid, pero también eh, conectados con mucha gente a través del mundo eh, y yo sé que son bastante numerosos. Mi nombre es Marie-Charlotte Bueso y a nombre de la Organización Mundial de la Salud quisiera primero agradecer a la Fundación Ramón Areces que nos acoge en este lugar maravilloso aquí en Madrid y que facilita también nuestro diálogo esta tarde con todos ustedes a través de la red y del apoyo tecnológico. Esta alegría está un poco mezclada hoy día con eh, algo de tristeza porque eh, el profesor Carlos Centeno no puede estar con nosotros físicamente en esta sala, pero sabemos que eh, se va a conectar de, de alguna manera. Eh, hay eh, varios eh, eh, temas que nos convocan hoy día. Eh, primero, yo... Eh, quisiera eh, celebrar el, eh, la trayectoria, el camino ya hecho eh, con Atlantes. Hoy día se celebra la designación de Atlantes como centro colaborador de la Organización Mundial de la Salud para Cuidados Paliativos. Y eso significa ya un recorrido importante en términos de colaboración, en términos de eh, trabajo en conjunto para el fortalecimiento de los cuidados paliativos a través del mundo. Es una eh, eh, celebración eh, que también tiene algo de prospectiva eh, porque también significa muchos proyectos por adelante, muchas razones de eh, discutir futuras eh, colaboraciones. Hoy día también nos convoca muchos temas de interés común y me alegro eh, saber que estas, eh, estos desafíos eh, nos, eh, nos convocan en distintos eh, lugares, que sean los lugares clínicos. Eh, quizás también están eh, con nosotros estudiantes eh, desde luego profesores, eh, gente que eh, tienen este compromiso para fortalecer los eh, cuidados paliativos. Desde la Organización Mundial de la Salud tenemos un mandato bastante claro. Eh, se nos dio este mandato a través de una resolución que se adoptó eh, en la Asamblea Mundial de la Salud en 2014, eso significa un compromiso de los 194 estados miembros eh, de la organización que decidieron trabajar, trabajar juntos con la organización eh, para mejorar el acceso eh, a cuidados paliativos a través del mundo. El enfoque de esa resolución, y eso lo vamos a discutir hoy día, eh, es eh, un enfoque... Eh, muy claro en torno a lo que nosotros llamamos la cobertura sanitaria universal. Eso significa que los cuidados, los cuidados paliativos no son una opción que deben hacer parte de lo que los servicios de salud deben entregar, deben proveer a la ciudadanía. Eso tiene eh, como base la atención primaria. Eh, me gusta decir que construir servicios de cuidados paliativos es como construir una casa. Y para construir una casa necesitamos fundaciones sólidas. La fundación eh, son eh, los servicios de atención primaria. Vamos a discutir eh, durante este simposio muchos aspectos eh, pero yo creo que debemos tener en mente eh, este eh, enfoque. La Casa de los Cuidados eh, Paliativos eh, requiere un compromiso amplio, eh, convoca responsabilidades distintas y necesitamos también trabajar eh, en conjunto 
en, y eso está bastante bien establecido también en la resolución que se adoptó en 2014. Trabajar, por supuesto, con las uh, autoridades sanitarias en todos los países, también con la sociedad civil. Y eso supone un compromiso fuerte de la universidad. Y ahí yo quiero eh, agradecer eh, a la Universidad de Navarra, donde está ubicado eh, Atlantes, por el apoyo eh, que, que da a este esfuerzo. Y a todas las universidades que tienen representantes en esta discusión hoy día, eh, que eh, seguramente son, representan un sector decisivo en materia de educación, eh, a los profesionales de salud y quizás más allá para eh, progresar eh, en este ámbito de los cuidados paliativos. La sociedad civil es también los ciudadanos y este debate debemos abrirlo a todos los ciudadanos de tal manera que podamos entender cuáles son los desafíos eh, que tenemos enfrente de nosotros cuando se trata de tomar en cuenta los más vulnerables y no dejar a nadie fuera de este compromiso ético que representa desarrollar los cuidados paliativos. Entonces, me alegro muchísimo estar con todos ustedes eh, aquí en esta sala y a través eh, de las eh, distintas conexiones que tenemos y eh, estoy... Um, muy exitosa eh, escuchar los distintos debates que vamos a abrir esta tarde. Quisiera eh, ahora in, invitar a Joaquín Julia, que es el eh, vicepresidente de la Sociedad Española de Cuidados Paliativos y que agradezco mucho por su presencia. Bien, gracias, María Charlotte. Buenas tardes. En nombre de la Sociedad Española de Cuidados Paliativos, SECPAL, agradezco la invitación del Observatorio Global de Cuidados Paliativos Atlantes, del Instituto de Cultura y Bienestar de la Universidad de Navarra, la Fundación Ramón Areces y la OMS, a participar en el, en el simposio que nos ocupa hoy. La verdad es que desde SECPAL consideramos que, que, que el simposio de hoy es realmente muy pertinente. La provisión de cuidados paliativos es una asignatura pendiente a nivel global, especialmente en los países con bajos o medios ingresos. Según los datos del propio Observatorio Atlantes y la OMS, más de 56 millones de personas cada año no reciben cuidados paliativos en el mundo y lo necesitan. De ellos, entre 80 y 100 mil están en España. Aunque la situación de, de los cuidados paliativos en España podría parecer consolidada y estable, su situación, si, si ponemos la lupa, está lejos de la excelencia. Podríamos echar como ejercicio un, un rápido vistazo a algunos de los indicadores de monitorización global propuestos en el informe de Atlantes para la OMS y comprobaríamos que estamos lejos de una situación óptima. Por ejemplo, no disponemos del número de pacientes atendidos por equipos especializados en cuidados paliativos. La Estrategia Nacional de Cuidados Paliativos en España eh, lleva al menos una década congelada. No existe la especialidad de medicina paliativa. La producción científica es de baja calidad, ya que, por ejemplo, no hay convocatorias públicas específicas para cuidados paliativos para poder conseguir recursos públicos para la investigación. La implantación territorial de los cuidados paliativos es como mínimo desigual y heterogénea entre comunidades autónomas. Y podríamos continuar hasta repasar todos los indicadores, no lo voy a hacer, no sé si para deprimirme o para, o para no aburrirles. Estaremos, sí, eso, eso sí, expectantes para poder conocer los resultados cuando se, se analice la situación con este paquete de indicadores desarrollado por Atlantes. Quisiera también poner en valor el informe de la Lancet Commission on the Value of Death de 31 de enero, donde encontramos múltiples alertas sobre el necesario cambio de paradigma en la atención al final de la vida. Se subraya en este informe la necesaria atención a la multidimensionalidad de las personas, superando el esquema de la atención a enfermedades. Se alerta sobre las diferencias y desigualdades 
en los procesos de atención a personas racializadas, por ejemplo, pobres o con diversidad afectivo-sexual. Se destaca cómo la situación post-COVID y el cambio climático ponen de manifiesto la insostenibilidad de nuestro sistema de atención al final de la vida, tremendamente hospitalizado y medicalizado. Tenemos también que abrirnos más a la sociedad, trabajar con las comunidades desde la base, en el barrio, en los centros cívicos, contribuir a coser de nuevo el, el proceso de, de final de vida al resto de nuestras vidas como parte ineludible de la trayectoria vital de las personas. Por todo ello, la reflexión en la jornada de hoy es de gran valor y puede darnos las claves para continuar trabajando para la provisión de una atención al final de la vida que sea competente, compasiva, personalizada, profesionalizada y sostenible. No hay duda que la tarde de hoy va a ser muy interesante y estimulante. Muchísimas gracias. Y voy a ceder la palabra a Paloma Grau, vicerrectora de Investigación y Sostenibilidad de la Universidad de Navarra. Paloma, cuando quieras. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Bueno, buenas tardes a todas y todos. Bienvenidos a este simposio internacional sobre cuidados paliativos que tan oportunamente ha organizado la Organización Mundial de la Salud. Gracias por apoyar esta especialización médica en todo el mundo, promoviendo el estudio y la investigación y el acceso a los cuidados médicos que tantas personas necesitan. Muchas gracias también por confiar la tarea de, de la monitorización global de los, a los Oratorio Atlantes de la Universidad de Navarra, centro colaborador desde la OMS desde este año. Esta designación supone para nosotros un gran reto y una motivación para seguir poniendo todo nuestro empeño en realizar un trabajo investigador de calidad. También agradezco a la Sociedad Española de Cuidados Paliativos su contribución en este evento y su enorme capacidad de convocatoria, tanto por los buenos ponentes como por, lo, por, lo que nos, por, los, por el número tan elevado de asistentes que nos acompañan presencialmente y online. Gracias también a la Fundación Ramón Areces por acogernos en su sede y por su incansable apoyo a la investigación a través de instituciones sanitarias y centros de investigación entre, entre los que se encuentra la Universidad de Navarra. Muchísimas gracias por todo lo que nos ayudáis. Con vuestra ayuda, pues la ciencia avanza y hace posible que la investigación esté alcanzando un gran impacto social. Así que nada, muchas gracias Mari Charlotte, muchas gracias Kim, muchas gracias Raimundo y bienvenidos a todos. ¿no? Comienza, bueno, yo creo que lo más importante ya sobre esta sesión, la oportunidad y la necesidad, ya se ha dicho, ¿no? pero sí que creo que como representante de una institución académica de la Universidad de Navarra, Creo que es importante poner en valor y recalcar la importancia de la presencia universitaria en este tipo de debates, reflexiones y encuentros. ¿no? La universidad, en esa triple misión de investigación, docencia, transferencia y divulgación, creo que tiene mucho que decir y debe estar presente. Si hablamos de investigación, ya se ha dicho, ¿no? es cada vez más claro la importancia de tener una buena investigación en este campo, yo creo que venimos de unos años donde se ha demostrado la importancia de la ciencia y la investigación y que duda cabe pues que tiene gran importancia y que la universidad, con todos sus profesores e investigadores, es un lugar idóneo. Y creo que en este ámbito la multidisciplinariedad cobra una especial relevancia ¿no? por, por aquello de que estamos abordando un problema que no se puede abordar solo desde un punto de vista, sino que requiere de múltiples visiones desde un punto de vista médico, psicológico. Y yo creo que la universidad puede ofrecer ese entorno por esa, por esa variedad ¿no? de expertos e investigadores en distintas áreas, desde médicos hasta humanistas hasta ingenieros, ¿no? Otro aspecto que también me parece muy importante mencionar es el de la formación, en la que confiamos todos, yo creo, como verdadero motor de cambio. ¿no? Está en nuestras manos formar en la universidad, sobre todo, a estudiantes que serán pues, los futuros médicos, expertos en paliativos, enfermeros, psicólogos, legisladores, expertos en datos, en gestión de datos y un sinfín de profesionales que pueden influir positivamente en que esta especialización prospere y, por tanto, mejore la vida de las personas. 
Además de la docencia propiamente reglada, yo creo que también es muy importante que la universidad esté en programas más especializados y dirigidos sobre todo a formar a profesionales que ya están ejerciendo su profesor en, profesión perdón, en el ámbito sanitario, actualizando sus, sus conocimientos en algunos casos o sensibilizándoles sobre aspectos tangibles e intangibles que son tan importantes en los cuidados paliativos. ¿no? Y por último, pues me alegra ver que esa tercera misión de la universidad, ¿no? que es la divulgación y la transferencia y el estar ahí donde la sociedad le necesita, pues también se materializa con simposios y foros como este. ¿no? En la Universidad de Navarra, pues ya lo he dicho, no somos conscientes de la importancia de esta especialidad médica. La medicina paliativa, centrada en las personas, alivia eficazmente el sufrimiento intenso de aquellos que padecen enfermedades graves y que en algunos casos, en muchos, se encuentran al final de la vida. ¿no? Por eso decimos que la medicina paliativa, y estas son palabras del doctor Carlos Centeno, la medicina paliativa es una medicina que sana cuando no se puede curar. Y por ser una línea de investigación centrada de lleno en las personas, la hemos escogido como una de nuestras líneas estratégicas de investigación en la universidad para los próximos años. Además de su importancia, pues también acompaña el hecho de que contamos ya con un grupo relevante de investigadores, con el doctor Carlos a la cabeza, Carlos Centeno, que hace muchos años que estudian sobre cuidados paliativos y están aportando resultados de un gran impacto científico a nivel nacional e internacional. Y es que ya en el 2006 comenzó en la Universidad de Navarra la investigación en medicina paliativa y se puso en marcha el primer equipo asistencial en la clínica de nuestra universidad. Desde entonces, pues no han parado. ¿no? En 2008 se introdujo la docencia de esta disciplina en los grados de Medicina, Enfermería, Psicología. Después, en 2012, se reforzó la interdisciplinariedad del grupo hasta convertirse hoy en el Observatorio Global de Cuidados Paliativos y Centro Colaborador de la OMS. Asimismo, tenemos la suerte de que los avances científicos encuentran enseguida su aplicación en la práctica asistencial, ya que el doctor Centeno es también el director de la Unidad de Medicina Paliativa en la Clínica Universidad de Navarra. Hoy también, aunque bueno, igual nos escucha y si no, pues ya se lo transmitiré personalmente cuando le vea, quiero darle las gracias a él y a todo su equipo por todos estos años de dedicación, por tantos resultados y publicaciones, congresos científicos y actividades divulgativas, por el cuidado de las personas. Y aprovecho también para animaros a que continuéis así, con todo vuestro esfuerzo, conscientes de que merece la pena el cuidado de las personas, especialmente cuando sufren. Enhorabuena a todos, también a los asistentes, por trabajar en esta noble misión. Y con el deseo bueno, pues de que este realmente sea un encuentro enriquecedor y que nos lleve la reflexión a todos, queda inaugurado oficialmente el simposio. So I think we can now um, open the dialogue um, we wanted to have today with all of you. Um, it is actually um, a pleasure for me to uh, chair this first panel um, with my co-chair, Ednin, who is actually quite far from us uh, today. Um, Ednin is uh, based in Malaysia. Um, he will uh, introduce himself and the, and the panelists in a moment. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of words with you uh, before uh, entering in this, uh, in this panel with our distinguished panelists today. The first word is the word ethics. I think um, the reason why we are here today has a lot to do with our understanding of uh, the ethos of our work. 
In the resolution I just mentioned, the resolution adopted by the World Health Assembly a few years ago, it is clearly established that ethics is the reason why we have to do something together to provide access to palliative care. Access to palliative care has been recognized as a fundamental human right. So if we don't do that, we violate a fundamental human right. It's a responsibility for clinicians, for policy makers, and for the whole community. The second word I would like to share with you is quite related to the first one, is the word equity. Uh, providing access to palliative care means thinking of the people who would have uh, the most difficulty to have access to it. As mentioned earlier, we estimate that around 56.8 million people need palliative care every year, but in reality, around 12% actually have access to it around the globe. So this is definitely one of the major challenge in the world. And this difference uh, is between countries, but even within country, between rural areas and uh, cities, for example. And I'm sure Emmanuel will uh, certainly uh, talk about this in a moment. The third word is quality. It's not enough to provide access. We have to make sure it's access to good palliative care. And to do so, we need to train people. We need to train professionals. We need to train uh, also people working in the area of social care, which is part of what we are discussing today. We need to inform the, the population. I'm sure um, Eduardo will um, uh, emphasize this point, the responsibility of universities have to do with this, to make sure we have the right people at the right time at the right place to provide good palliative care. Another important concept is no border. Palliative care is needed by people living in very different settings, including in the context of humanitarian crisis, of armed conflict, and we have to think seriously about this. Probably Julie will help us to think about this. Finally, we need to build trust. This is another key word. There's no progress in general in public health and probably in life if we are not able to build trust. To do so, we have to be serious about um, the message, the information we share with the public. We also have to evaluate seriously what we do. And this is one of the key collaboration the WHO has already established with Atlantis with the development of this technical tool to assess the quality of palliative care services around the globe. This is how we can build the trust with the people we want to serve in our communities. So building the house of palliative care is also building trust. And I hope we can contribute to this today. So it's my pleasure now to turn on to um, Ednin, um, please, Ednin, be sure you are connected. I see your smile. So I know it's, it's very late for you in, in uh, Malaysia. Uh, Ednin is the director of Hospice Malaysia uh, since 1997. So uh, it's a very long uh, commitment. He has been involved in a number of uh, educational programs and currently chairing the ASEAN Network for Palliative Care. Over to you, Ennin, and thank you very much for being with us, even virtually, 
today. Over to you. Thank you very much, Sarita. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I, I'm sorry I can't be in, in wonderful Spain, but I'm so glad to be part of this wonderful symposium. I think it's, it's thank you for, for talking a little bit about the. the, the He's been actively involved in the development of palliative care, both in Uganda and throughout Africa. Um, he's served on, on several research data, safety monitoring boards, and research steering committees, and is published on HIV and palliative care in Africa. He's, um, he's interested in the prevention of communicable and non-communicable diseases in a chronic care setting, a family approach to care, and the integration of chronic and palliative care approach in healthcare systems. Um, from on, on the top of the screen there, you've got Eduardo Barrera from MD Anderson, US. Um, he is director of the De Department of Palliative Care and Rehabilitation Medicine at the University of Texas, uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center. He received his medical degree from the University of Rosario in Argentina and specialized in oncology, and then went to the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada, where he directed the clinical and academic palliative care program until 1999. He moved to the University of Texas MD Anderson, where he currently holds the FT uh, McGraw Chair in Cancer Treatment and Director of Department of Palliative Care, uh, Re Rehabilitation and Integrative Medicine. His uh, primary clinical interest is in the care of physical and, and psychological problems of patients with advanced cancer and, and the support of the families. And he has been very interested and, and very instrumental in the development of international palliative care programs in, in so many countries. And, and finally, you've got Julie, who's sitting right there in the center. Julie is um, the executive director of the European Association for Palliative Care, the chair of the World Hospice and Palliative Care Alliance, and a board member of the Health Research Board of Ireland, as well as consultant technical officer for palliative care at the World Health Organization. She's worked as a palliative care nurse for over 30 years, both for adults and children, and has held various positions in clinical care, management, research, policy, and voluntary sector. Um, in July 2021, she was appointed consultant technical specialist in palliative care for WHO Europe, and she's published in, in many uh, journals um, as well. So I think we've got three wonderful um, panelists here that I'm sure we are waiting um, intently for, for the presentation. So I think without any further delay, um, let's start, let's get the ball rolling and, and perhaps um, Emmanuel, um, you can start first, and and you're you're going to be talking about palliative care in Africa, in and in low and middle income countries. So, Emmanuel, um, thank you very much, um, uh, University of Navarra, uh, Professor Centeno, WHO, and the Foundation for inviting us to be part of this uh, process. Uh, I would like the person who is doing slides to, do, uh, to start the slides. Um, as you've been told, I work with the African Palliative Care Association and we work towards four main objectives. One is create awareness about palliative care at all levels and two, strengthening health systems by integration of palliative care, looking at medicines, policy, education and service delivery. And then um, the last um, objective is to... Uh, create sustainability for the discipline in Africa. Um, can I run my own slides here? Or the
Thank you very much. Um, before the COVID pandemic, um, Africa was already disadvantaged in terms of access to palliative care, in terms of human resources, lack of specific indicators in national level data, limited access to essential medicines and technologies, and the emergence of COVID-19 has complicated that. So this presentation will summarize um, the state of palliative care and steps and innovation taken by APCA and the countries and other players on the continent. Just to remind you, Africa has 54 member states. Um, 24 of those are in the low income list, uh, and those are out of the 27 globally. The other three are in the Middle East. Out of the 36 globally highly indebt indebted countries, Africa has 34. We have a population of 1.4 billion, and we have five palliative care training institutions um, that run degrees, diplomas on the whole continent. And less than, as Marie Sharot told you, less than 15% of the population access palliative care. And in some countries like Burundi, it's between 0 and 1%. Our oldest hospice was built in 1978 in Zimbabwe, in Harare, in Zimbabwe. Before we talk about anything else, one of the main issues is communication. And Africa has Francophone countries, Lusophone or Portuguese-speaking countries, Arabic-speaking countries, Spanish. We have one Spanish-speaking country, that is Equatorial Guinea. And we have thousands of local languages. But not enough resources are put in translating all the palliative care communications into the languages that patients and their fam families understand. There is need to translate these tools from English and maybe French into all the other languages where possible and to support the packaging of palliative care information uh, specifically for patients and their families. If I may focus now on palliative care governance and policy frameworks in Africa, uh, countries, there are countries that have palliative care specific policies. We have Rwanda, Eswatini or Swaziland, Malawi, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Tanzania, Kenya. And in Uganda, theirs is about to be launched. But you note that most of those countries are in, are in East and Southern Africa. Some have packaged palliative care into other frameworks, such as their uh, health sector strategic plans, cancer policy, HIV policy, and other vertical programs. In terms of palliative care financing, most of the services in Africa are actually run by civil society organizations, NGOs, faith-based organizations, um, which also connect to home care programs and are largely funded by philanthropy. So we have countries like South Africa, Uganda, Kenya, Eswatini, Malawi, DRC, and Nigeria. In a few countries, it is integrated in national health services. National health uh, services. You have Rwanda, Botswana, South Africa, again, Eswatini, Uganda, Malawi, and to an extent, Ghana. And as I've said, countries like Burundi have very rudimentary palliative care services. In terms of access to essential palliative care medicines and technologies, there are some good models which can be picked from some of these countries. For example, Uganda, um, the Uganda government pays for the reconstitution of oral morphine from powder, and that is provided free of charge as solution to all patients. Whether you are in a public hospital or a private hospital, the government pays for it, and you access it free of charge. Uh, some of the other countries have access to essential medicines, but it's difficult to access morphine in particular at the level three of the WHO step ladder. If I may give an example of DRC, where we are doing some work at the moment, a bottle um, of, of oral morphine solution costs $10. Now, very few patients can afford to pay 
uh, ten dollars for that bottle. And that picture shows you when shows you what happened when we visited their Department of Pharmaceuticals and Med Medicaments on a project that we are implementing together with Belgian government and United Nations Office on Drug and Crime. Still on access to um, essential palliative care medicines, um, we, we need to work together with the other people who use essential medicines. Here you see the team from DRC visiting Uganda where alcohol and drug unit also uses controlled medicines and therefore working together to ensure there is access to essential palliative care medicines. Concerning technologies, about 25 countries in Africa are considered not to have any radiotherapy at all. But we know that radiotherapy is an essential modality in palliative care for cancer patients. And we know that some of the emergency, um, the palliative care emergencies like cord compression, bleeding, and others can be managed with radiotherapy. But some of those countries have zero radiotherapy. In terms of the health information systems, some of the countries have comprehensive palliative care registers. For example, Uganda has just launched its register. Uh, South Africa, they are able to collect data. Uh, but some of the countries have nothing at all. In terms of service delivery, we also have some good models. A country like Botswana will fund a non-government hospice to provide palliative care services where government cannot. Um, and then um, some of the countries, like South Africa again and Botswana, they will give money to non-government hospices to deliver the services. If you go to the hospices in South Africa, you find that they get grants from the provincial or the national governments. And then in Rwanda, they are introducing a community health insurance. They have introduced, and they are building palliative care onto that. Um, in terms of human resources, uh, we have some countries that are running courses. South Africa at the University of Cape Town does that. Hospice Africa, Uganda, and Makerere University run it, certificate, diploma, postgraduate diploma, bachelor's, and master's degree. Um, and then in, in Uganda and South Africa, we have the pediatric palliative care diploma. So these are just two countries out of 54. What are the other palliative care pa challenges? At the patient level, we've talked about communication. We've talked about having comprehensive management of pain and symptoms. And of course, there are rising complex conditions because in Africa, we still have some of the neglected tropical diseases, which you'll not find in Europe or in other continents. You'll find Bilharzia, you'll find Leishmaniasis, and then those also complicate uh, palliative care. And then at family level, the challenges are access to resources. At health work level, it's issues around training and the facilities where they work. And then at the health system level, not having enough resources. The summary here is in a paper that we've just published together with our colleagues at Open Society Foundations in terms of what happened over five years from 2017 to uh, 2021 in terms of policy development, training palliative care providers, improving access to oral morphine, and scaling up palliative care services, which means we can actually step up those models. I'll also talk about what happened when we had COVID-19. Um, when COVID-19 broke out, Eve, who is seated here, my colleague, where I work, who is in charge of research, she worked with some of our colleagues in Europe to do a survey to see how prepared um, uh, were the hospices um, and how were they affected. Um, the objectives were to evaluate the preparedness and capacity of African palliative care services to respond to COVID-19, and a cross-sectional study was done. Um, in, um, this was sent to 166 palliative care associations and mem member institutions. And then um, descriptive analysis were done. 83 um, from 21 countries participated and completed the survey. 63% had at least one procedure for the case management of COVID-19 or other infectious disease. Remember that most of the hospices in Africa are based in the community. 
They are not inpatient. They provide services within the homes. Um, respondents reported concerns of accessing running water, soap, disinfectant products in those uh, percentages. But they also had concerns about their own security. 41% um, do not have any or make available additional personal protective equipment. 80% reported having the capacity to use technology instead of face-to-face -face appointments. And that is because of the mobile phone. Because the mobile phone has broken out so much in Africa, it can be used as a vehicle to do other things. In fact, you find somebody who is 15 and has, or 16 or even 20 and has never seen the phone, the traditional phone as you know it, but they know the mobile phone. 52% reported having palliative care protocols for symptom and management control and, and psychological support that could be shared with non-health care staff in their facilities. Uh, now, during that season, many hospices resorted to telemedicine, again with the mobile phone, and the lockdowns that were uh, started resulted into limited access to palliative care uh, access for both COVID-19 patients and non-COVID-19 patients. And uh, for the COVID-19 patients, because of isolation. For the non-COVID-19, because of the limitations of travel. But there were also other issues. We know that in South Africa, they had 150,000 people getting palliative care. But since the epidemic, 14 hospices in South Africa have closed because of financial impact. And this is despite the increasing need for, uh, um, for the services. Um, now, in Kenya, we've worked with them to cost the basic palliative care package for inclusion into universal health coverage. Um, uh, that has the personnel, it has the medicines, it has um, the psychosocial and other components. But we also found that in Kenya, because of the lockdowns, many patients were not able to get the services they need. However, uh, APCA working with the City Cancer Challenge, we've been able to keep some of those things going even during the COVID um, um, lockdowns. We also know that during the COVID-19 lockdown, we were able to work with DRC on improving their access to controlled medicines, not only for palliative care, but also for the other um, needs for controlled medicines. Guidelines have been developed. And then the, the team in DRC visited Uganda to see how they manage essential medicines and other systems. And that, those are the pictures you see in there. Um, I'll move on quickly. Um, uh, for the DRC team, they found it important to continue running the training for their selected 10 hospitals, and that continued despite COVID, meaning that even in Africa, despite the challenges, we can continue running online programs even during lockdowns so that health workers can, can continue to be equipped. Um, when COVID broke, down, broke out, many of the governments diverted money, and so palliative care suffered. But the advantage is that some of the trusts and foundations that fund palliative care were flexible to let the hospices use that money in, in the new situation that had arisen. However, we got a new challenge, misinformation, uh, that went around because of the availability of the mobile phone and uh, um, WhatsApp a lot of uh, misinformation went out within Africa. And that has hampered not only access to services, but even vaccination. And we were able to link up with the WHO on how to handle misinformation. But that's something that came up during the COVID um, uh, outbreak. Uh, at APCA, we worked together to package information for families, uh, patients and their families. And we find that that is very important. If we are to make progress in palliative care, communication is going to be part of that package, whether there is COVID-19 or not. Um, we also need to strengthen hybrid methods of accessing patients, uh, telehealth, telemedicines, as well as delivering capacity building. Um, We've run, for example, during that period of the lockdown, we were able to run webinars, several webinars, 
um, um, to be able to access information, to continue accessing information, despite the challenges that we are there, which again shows you that we need to embrace technology more and more within the African context. context. Um, at APCA, when the COVID vaccine was found, we found that it was very important for palliative care people to be involved in spreading the information about COVID vaccination because there was already trust. And we've done an example. We've, we did that through videos, and I've shared a link there to one of the videos we did. So the future of palliative care in Africa will depend on strengthening the whole continuum from um, awareness, diagnosis, treatment, adherence, support, rehabilitation, and palliative care, and using a family approach. Uh, governments and NGOs to use their networks uh, of hospitals, schools, clinics, and congregations for sharing information and service delivery, and integration of palliative care in pre-service and post uh, and in-service training uh, programs, as well as in other uh, programs like HIV and uh, non-communicable diseases. We also need to consider the need that grows with the aging population. In Africa, we don't yet have that big number of old persons, but very soon we'll have it, and we need to prepare for that. We also need to adopt the very good indicators to be able to measure and using the results rationally to fund and improve services. So in conclusion, palliative care development in Africa has been a partnership between the non-government and government. Palliative care systems are still poor, um, and we need to do more. The emergence of COVID-19 has called for a quick readjustment and innovations with palliative care uh, needs in Africa um, and uh, to progressively improve on, 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 on what we, we do. Um, integration cannot be avoided into the health system and investing more in health. The African countries long ago agreed about, uh, on, in the Abuja declaration that 15% of their national budgets should go to health. But we find that less than three of the countries have successfully done that. If we are to do that, governments need to invest more into palliative care. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, we will continue with all the presentations and then we'll, we'll have some questions. So I'd like to invite um, our next speaker, Eduardo Guerra, and, and his um, topic will be to talk about the introduction of palliative care into the academic world. Um, Eduardo? Thank you so much. I'm, I'm delighted to, to be here. And uh, como espero eh, que les parezca bien, eh, mi presentación va a ser en español. Eh, la diapositiva está en inglés. La familia sufre, la familia sufre físicamente y sufre financieramente. Esta familia en Brasil sufría cuando estaba enferma eh, una, uno de los miembros de la familia. Y este doctor dijo hace un par de años, un doctor español de Córdoba dijo, 
Eh, los grandes médicos tratan pacientes, no enfermedades, pero la medicina no está organizada así. Yo trabajo en un hospital que ustedes ven acá atrás mío, el asigno S, que es un hospital que es un centro de cáncer, no es un centro para pacientes con cáncer. Y cuando cruzan la calle de mi hospital ven algo más ridículo, que es el Texas Heart Institute, porque por lo menos nosotros hacemos hígado, riñón, pulmón. El, el, el Texas Heart Institute hace corazón. Usted lleva a la mañana su corazón, lo deja ahí, ellos trabajan todo el día y lo pasa a buscar a la la tarde y eso sería una muy buena biomédica forma de encarar la enfermedad, pero no realista, porque el paciente tiene su corazón, pero lo tiene pegado al resto de, de su persona y desgraciadamente nuestras organizaciones tienen un concepto totalmente basado en la enfermedad. Somos un movimiento de protesta que empezó en los años 60 cuando fracasaba el paciente a responder a nuestros tratamientos entonces eh, eran rescatados en estas pequeñas casitas y se los empezaba a tratar eh, en forma impecable. El manejo de sus síntomas, de su sufrimiento, preparar para el fin de la vida y eso siguen siendo los principios de lo que hacemos ahora. Pero sin embargo, Meanwhile Back at the Ranch, como decimos en Texas, eh, en la serie de televisión esta, eh, la medicina organizada seguía creciendo en especialidades. Y muchas especialidades, incluido la oncología clínica, que es la especialidad mía de base, eh, se crearon más de 10 años más tarde que los cuidados paliativos. Pero nosotros nacimos fuera de los votos matrimoniales. Nosotros nacimos fuera del sistema médico y por eso nos costó tanto ser aceptados y entrar en el sistema médico y universitario y todavía seguimos con ese desafío de ser aceptado este cuerpo de conocimientos por los eh, trabajadores de la salud. Hemos hecho gran progreso en el manojo del cáncer o de la enfermedad cardíaca o de la enfermedad renal. También hemos hecho mucho progreso en el manejo de las comorbilidades que acompañan esa enfermedad, pero no hemos hecho tanto progreso como deberíamos en el manejo del sufrimiento de la persona. Y todos ustedes cuando van a un hospital a, un, a, a, a visitar a su médico saben que esto pasa y todos ustedes saben que hay una falla de conocimiento y de cómo implementar técnicas para aliviar el sufrimiento de forma disciplinada y en forma científica. Eh, sabemos que cuando el paciente se queja de síntomas, puede ser su mm, cáncer de pulmón, puede ser su terapia targeted, pero también pueden ser un montón de otros factores que están contribuyendo a esa sensación de enfermedad y hace que se, eh, que se, eh, y que se expresen en eh, la intensidad de los síntomas. Eh, I, uh, I think you're translating for me, if you're able to block me, so... Uh, I'm, I'm hearing my own translation, that's why. Uh, uh, wonderful. Entonces, hay una cantidad de dominios importantes que deben ser eh, 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 analizados y estudiados cuidadosamente. Eh, uh, I, I, still, I, still, I still hear you, uh, I'm sorry, I still hear you on my system. Sure, no, that's great. I think it's okay now. Perfect. Entonces, eh, todos estos dominios requieren disciplina y requieren conocimiento. Y empezamos desde lo rojo, que es lo eh, urgente, hacia lo azul, que es lo importante. Todos estos dominios son parte de lo que sabemos hacer en paliativos o lo que debemos saber hacer en medicina para ayudar al sufrimiento humano. El tratamiento del sufrimiento en ese estado de la vida es complejo. Cada uno de nosotros tiene experiencias que contribuyen al sufrimiento y el oncólogo, internista y, family medic, y el médico de familia han fracasado en aliviar el sufrimiento antes de mandar al enfermo. Entonces, la sobresimplificación, esto se puede hacer en la casa, esto se puede hacer con tres pesos, eh, no ha llevado a un progreso importante porque el sufrimiento humano es un poco más complejo de lo que se ha aceptado por parte de nuestros colegas. Y ha habido una evolución que empezó al final de la vida, 
luego evolucionó un poquito más hacia las unidades de cuidados paliativos en hospitales de agudos, pero aún cerca del final de la vida, y luego pasó al tratamiento eh, ambulatorio, que nosotros lo empezamos por primera vez en los años 80 en, en, en Edmonton, en Canadá, y luego el tratamiento precoz, que empezó con los estudios de Jennifer Temel en Boston, y por supuesto COVID trajo la telemedicina, que ofrece enorme potencial para llegarle a gente a la cual no le podíamos llegar antes, o que ellos no podían llegar a nosotros, pero que ahora con un teléfono podemos llegarle. Y fíjense cómo va cambiando la línea de acceso al sufrimiento humano, que antes estaba limitado a los últimos días de vida, y ahora podemos llegar a toda la trayectoria de la enfermedad. Pero también se necesita la medicina basada en la evidencia. Y ahí es donde están fallando los decanos de facultades, los ministros de salud, los directores de hospitales, le están fallando a los pacientes por no establecer este cuerpo de medicina basada en evidencia. Este magnífico equipo, ustedes ven, acá estoy yo hace tres meses en el equipo de Canadá, y ustedes ven ahí que este equipo no lo pueden tener en una, en una comunidad. Este es el equipo complejo interdisciplinario de múltiples disciplinas que alivia bien el sufrimiento humano. Entonces, se necesitan estructuras, procesos y resultados distintos y eso frustra a los ejecutivos, frustra a los gerentes, frustra a los decanos, pero está bien, hay que frustrarlos, porque si no los frustramos, no estamos cambiando nada y eh, ladran Sancho, señal que cabalgamos. Este es el crecimiento de nuestro servicio en los últimos 11 años, eh, creció 1.600%, el MD Anderson creció 340 y la división de, medicina, de, de, de oncología 300%. Crecimos cinco veces más que el resto del hospital eh, y no crecimos porque el hospital planeó eso. El hospital tuvo que reaccionar a eso porque los médicos, enfermeras, trabajando en los pisos, nos mandaban los pacientes sufriendo porque veían cómo se podía aliviar ese sufrimiento. Hace 25 años la oncología hacía esto. Yo practicaba este tipo de oncología con estas limitaciones en lo que se podía hacer y ha habido una explosión de desarrollo y todos estos desarrollos que se han desarrollado últimamente se adoptan muy rápido y hay un montón de cosas nuevas que se hacen en la oncología que no se hacían hace 25 años, por lo tanto, si yo quisiera practicar la oncología hoy sería peligroso. ¿Qué pasó con cuidados paliativos? Teníamos estos recursos terapéuticos y tenemos estos mismos recursos terapéuticos. Tenemos estos recursos diagnósticos y de evaluación y tenemos algo muy parecido aún, desgraciadamente, pero sin embargo, a pesar de eso, todavía no se adoptan. Todavía nuestros colegas médicos universitarios y terciarios no adoptan los conocimientos que existen desde hace mucho tiempo. Hay pocos fellowships en los hospitales elite de cáncer de Estados Unidos. Hay más eh, fellows en, pali en paliativos en los hospitales en los centros no elite que tienen fellow de oncología, no tienen fellowship de cuidados paliativos, tampoco hay obligación de que los oncólogos roten por medicina paliativa, nosotros lo tenemos en años hace muchos años, pero si ustedes miran, inclusive en los centros de elite, no hay ese énfasis. Y por último, hay menos, un, menos del 60% de los centros de elite de investigación tienen algún tipo de investigación en cuidados paliativos y de los centros no elite que todos tienen investigación en cuidados oncológicos, fíjense que una minoría eh, mínima tiene programas de investigación en cuidados paliativos. O sea que no está todavía el entendimiento y hay una gran oportunidad para el futuro. El, el cáncer, pero hablamos de la insuficiencia cardíaca, el AIDS, cualquier otra enfermedad, habla con el cerebro y el sufrimiento pasa en el cerebro y hay vías aferentes que llevan esa información en las cuales podemos tener una acción antes de que la información llegue al cerebro y también dentro del cerebro para aliviar el sufrimiento. También sabemos que el dolor que en mi época era un cablecito que llegaba a la corteza somatosensorial es más complejo de lo que sabíamos y tiene efectos sobre el sistema reticular, sobre el sistema límbico y me hace sentir mal y sobre la corteza prefrontal y sabemos que ese sistema límbico es 
enormemente importante en la generación de sentimientos de sufrimiento, toda esta sensación de sufrimiento, y también en el estado de bienestar que induce el opioide, para bien o para mal, y que el opioide que alivia la estimulación nociceptiva, que alivia lo malo del dolor, también causa ese tipo de, de satisfacción que lleva en uno de cada cinco pacientes a empezar a utilizar más rápidamente el opioide y a tener problemas de utilización no médica del opioide y potencialmente de dependencia. Entonces, hemos desarrollado de sistemas para evaluar a los pacientes. Hemos desarrollado sistemas para establecer el riesgo que tiene el paciente de estar en este grupo del 20% o estar en el grupo del 80% que no va a tener problemas. Y también cuando el paciente desarrolla esa conducta, cuando cae dentro de este 20%, estrategias para manejar el sufrimiento del paciente y la utilización del opioide y mantener el paciente eh, eh, libre de riesgo en un ambiente donde hay tanta mortalidad por opioides, tanta mortalidad en todo el mundo por opioides. La, el alivio de la disnea, hemos desarrollado eh, mecanismos para entender la percepción del síntoma y la generación del síntoma en distintos lugares. Y todos estos son dianas, dianas para intervenciones terapéuticas a, a, a múltiples niveles, desde rehabilitatorias hasta farmacológicas eh, que no necesitan necesariamente aliviar la causa subyacente. Porque si esperamos aliviar la causa subyacente, como todos nos vamos a morir, en algún momento vamos a fracasar. Tenemos que tratar el síntoma en sí, no a, a través de la causa subyacente, porque entonces cualquiera sea la causa subyacente vamos a poder aliviar el sufrimiento innecesario. El delirium, que es perder un poco el control del cerebro cerca del fin de la vida, también conocemos ahora muchísimo más con respecto a lo que pasa en los astrocitos, en los vasos sanguíneos, en las eh, conexiones entre las distintas neuronas y en el tejido de soporte. Y tenemos un montón de potenciales dianas terapéuticas Estamos bien vestidos, pero no tenemos dónde ir, porque no nos dan los recursos, los profesores, los asistentes, el, la, 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 el acceso a lo que tiene la universidad para la gastroenterología, endocrinología y, gastro y, y, y oncología, no está disponible para el sufrimiento en este momento. Hay manejo del sufrimiento a través de eh, patentes eh, que pueden ayudar a manejar el delirio y hay intervenciones farmacológicas y no farmacológicas que podemos considerar para disminuir todos los factores contribuyentes a que la persona tenga esa falla cognitiva. La fatiga es el síndrome más común en los pacientes con enfermedad crónica, crónica cardíaca, respiratoria, renal y cáncer. Y sabemos también que hay mecanismos eh, por qué sucede y que hay potencial para establecer terapéuticas para la fatiga y aliviarla dramáticamente con múltiples intervenciones. La caquexia, la pérdida, la pérdida de peso, eso que le da ese aspecto que vimos al principio con nuestro paciente, también hemos empezado a entender los mecanismos por lo cual sucede y también es una posibilidad enorme de que podamos intervenir en la génesis de esto. En un momento en el cual las etapas de Kubler-Ross de aceptación de la muerte siempre pasan por inmunoterapia, que se ha vuelto una de las etapas in, imposibles de evitar, eh, eh, la terapia eh, inmunológica no es tan bien tolerada como pensábamos hace años y hay problemas que agrega la terapia inmunológica. Y además, cuando se da innecesariamente, tiene un efecto devastador sobre las finanzas del sistema de salud y devastador sobre las finanzas del paciente y su familia, que hacen sacrificios tremendos para acceder a la inmunoterapia, eh, porque es un poco eh, la última esperanza eh, para el paciente. ¿Cómo puedo hacer yo mi práctica más basada en el paciente? El sufrimiento aumenta agudamente la percepción de pequeños actos de generosidad, de, de grandeza y pequeños años de actos de falta de generosidad. ¿Puedo yo crear placebo? ¿Puedo yo crear una sensación de bienestar en mis intervenciones clínicas? Nosotros creemos que sí y que la acción paliativa mejora el resultado. Un opioide, un laxante, un hipnótico dado en un contexto paliativo funciona mucho mejor porque creo en mi paciente la expectativa de mejorar. Llamar a los pacientes es importante, llamarlos mejora su calidad de vida y 
es una intervención importantísima el teléfono, llamar al paciente, no contestar su llamada, llamarlo y tener gente que lo llame directamente, por supuesto, además de responder sus llamadas, darles hojitas con preguntas para que el paciente sepa qué preguntarnos, para inspirar al paciente y a la familia a que hagan preguntas. Eh, no prolongan el encuentro médico, el paciente está más contento, lo puede adoptar usted hoy. Sentarse cuando vemos el paciente. Marañón decía que el, instrumento, el más importante instrumento médico es la silla y fíjense, desde la época de Marañón nosotros publicamos en nuestro equipo el primer trabajo randomizado, controlado de sentado o no sentado para ver el resultado que tenía sobre el paciente y llevó a lo mejor un siglo más tarde. Así hacíamos nosotros cuidados paliativos. Eso nos parecía correcto y después empezamos a pensar, a lo mejor sentándonos tenemos un efecto y realmente encontramos eso, que a ciegas, sin saber, el paciente consideraba más compasivo, profesional y que había pasado más tiempo el médico sentado con respecto al parado. Siempre examinar al paciente. Y esto cuando están abandonándose el examen físico, lo que nos dijeron 148 pacientes fue que le dieron enorme valor a que el médico pusiera las manos sobre ellos. Y no solo por razones pragmáticas, porque el médico puede aprender algo nuevo sobre ellos, pero también por simbólico. El médico tocando al paciente quiere decir que el médico se preocupa por el bienestar del paciente. Dar un, una, decirle que prenda en el teléfono y que, y que registre que registre la, la, la conversación. No aumenta el tiempo, no aumenta el riesgo legal. De hecho, los abogados quieren que uno grabe las conversaciones. El mínimo costo. ¿Y por qué no se le da una, una registración para que la familia pueda escuchar con el paciente? Evitar usar el, 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 la historia clínica electrónica durante el encuentro para que el paciente no crea que está tratando de hacer el check-in en United Airlines o en Iberia, que realmente está viendo a un profesional que lo está mirando a la cara sin una computadora entre medio. Hicimos un estudio randomizado controlado, también a ciegas, cuando el paciente, cuando el médico no usa el ordenador se encuentra, el paciente lo percibe como más compasivo, más profesional, habiendo pasado más tiempo y lo prefiere al médico que no usa el ordenador en el encuentro clínico. Eh, música, ¿por qué no ponemos música? Porque en realidad eh, eh, nos dicen que el hospital es silencioso y el hospital tiene el mismo ruido que eh, la Gran Vía un día de trabajo. Entonces, eh, adoptar música es importante. Eh, nos dicen que hay que tener sala de espera y gente sufriendo, mutilada, caquéctica, en una sala de espera no es muy confortable, entonces lo importante es que los pacientes entren directamente, si quieren sala de espera, ahí la tienen y la tenemos vacía, y ahí poner el paciente en lugares donde tienen una cama entera en lugar de una sala de examen, donde se les pasa mensajitos sobre la constipación, sobre la fatiga, sobre la espiritualidad, mientras esperan a ver al médico en lugar de ver la otra televisión, donde se lo visita al paciente, donde los signos están puestos de tal manera que aquel que viene en una silla de rueda o que viene en una camilla pueda ver esos signos para que el paciente entienda que en Estamos más empáticos con su experiencia. Tener estas salas donde se pueden tener las conversaciones importantes. Tener los equipos como este que tenemos ambulatorio en el Anderson. Y tener nuestros psicólogos, nuestros capellanes que puedan ver al paciente por video o que puedan ver al paciente en persona. Recibirlos con un clínico. El secretario o secretaria que trabaja en el, en, el, en, el, en el escritorio al principio es parte del equipo clínico, parte de la experiencia clínica del paciente sufriente empieza con la primera llamada telefónica y entrenar a ese personal para que se sientan clínicos es importante. Todo esto que dijimos que eran cosas importantes requirieron este tipo de estudios, de lo contrario no se adoptan y estos estudios requieren del contenido académico requieren que hagamos los estudios, pero si no nos emplean, si no nos dan puestos de trabajo, si no nos dan la posibilidad de hacer academia, no hay mejoría. No hay mejoría porque estos no son temas de enorme interés para los cardiólogos, endocrinólogos, cirujanos. Estos son temas para nosotros y nosotros podemos ayudarlos a ellos generando este, este conocimiento. No importa lo que hagamos en el hospital, no puede reemplazar lo que se hace en la casa. Eso le conviene a mucha gente. Pero ¿qué pasa cuando la casa es así? ¿Y qué pasa cuando no hay familia? 
¿Qué pasa con el sufrimiento? Entonces, necesitamos tener unidades de cuidados paliativos para bajar el sufrimiento. Y luego que el sufrimiento baja, si hay mucho apoyo, y apoyo son dos cosas, dinero y familia. Y si el dinero más importante que la familia, porque el dinero a veces compra familia, pero dinero y familia. Y si no hay dinero y familia, lugares compasivos, lugares donde el paciente pueda recibir sus cuidados hasta el fin de su vida y no estar aislado en la calle. El equipo solamente lo ven ustedes eh, en las instituciones y por eso es necesario. El mundo está cambiando. Como decía Bob Dylan, the times are changing, él dijo, y realmente eh, hay evidencia que los cuidados paliativos funcionan eh, precozmente. Hay crecimiento en los centros más sofisticados de cáncer. Hay métrica de cuidados paliativos desarrollada. Eh, Muchas veces las aseguradoras están demandando que antes de que un paciente se le ponga un ELVAT para el corazón o un estudio de fase 1, lo vea paliativos. Fíjense, el asegurador quiere eso porque ahorra tratamientos innecesarios. Reconocimiento de las necesidades de Supportive Care durante el COVID ayudó mucho y, por supuesto, el burnout, la epidemia entre los, entre los profesionales de la salud que hace que tantos se estén alejando de los cuidados de salud y la demanda de la familia. Eh, nuestro lenguaje, hemos pasado de pacientes terminales a pacientes enfermos seriamente, de narcóticos a op opioides, de adicción y abuso y mal uso a uso no médico, de pacientes con, de, con cáncer, de, de, de cancer patients a pacientes con cáncer. O sea, poner el paciente en lugar de poner el cáncer adelante y de una guerra a una enfermedad crónica. ¿Qué va a cambiar en los próximos 10 años? Estructuras, procesos y resultados. Estructuras, cada hospital que tenga una unidad de cuidados intensivos va a tener una unidad de cuidados paliativos porque no es moral no tenerla. Cada sistema ambulatorio va a tener un sistema ambulatorio de cuidados de soporte para poder ver esos pacientes precozmente cuando están sufriendo. Y cada hospital y escuela de medicina va a tener un departamento independiente de cuidados de soporte y paliativo. Los procesos, entonces, se pueden hacer porque cada paciente completa una evaluación y cuando se detecta sufrimiento va al centro de soporte ambulatorio o cuando tiene mal pronóstico, o cuando se necesita tener conversaciones de fin de vida, o cuando está usando el opioide en forma no médica. Y va a haber sistemas para que esos pacientes los podamos ver hoy, no en una semana o en 15 días. Y otras disciplinas van a ser eh, reclutadas por el grupo de Supportive Care, pero ya va a haber un contacto. Los goals of car, no goals of care, pero goals of car, que es usted se compra un auto y usted tiene objetivos, si usted no planea nada, y no se compra el cinturón de seguridad y no cierra el auto cuando va al supermercado, pueden pasarle cosas malas y sin cambiar su objetivo, usted puede prepararse por cosas que puedan andar mal. Con el cáncer o con la enfermedad cardíaca o renal es lo mismo. Usted puede seguir esperando prolongar su vida y entrar en estudios clínicos, pero hablar de mis planes funerales, quién se queda con la casa, con quién me mudo si ya no puedo... Eh, alimentarme o bañarme, son medidas de plan B que no deterioran mi esperanza de la y las puedo empezar a hacer antes. La práctica individual deja muchos agujeros, la práctica en congreso donde usted hace un, una, una referencia a 20 servicios crea conflicto y demandas para el paciente y el sistema, integrar el tratamiento primitivo con el oncólogo, con el cardiólogo, con el respirólogo y el equipo de paliativo y soporte es la forma más efectiva de ayudar a esos pacientes. Y entonces eh, mejorar eh, el, 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 el sufrimiento de las familias es medible, disminuir la fatiga terapéutica de los médicos, mejorar las, las, las medidas de calidad médica, ahorrar muchísimo dinero en intervenciones que se hacen a estos pacientes porque no saben hacer otra cosa. Y, por supuesto, si usted quiere estar por delante de eso, ¿por qué no empezar hoy en lugar de esperar a 2032 para que esto pase? Entonces yo quería dejarlos con el mensaje de que hay grandes desafíos hay grandes oportunidades y agradecerle profundamente a la Fundación, agradecerle profundamente a todos los que están involucrados en crear este sistema y que en cualquier lugar del mundo donde haya médicos y enfermeras, 
y así como se desarrollan los programas eh, que existen en las facultades de medicina, el cuidado de soporte paliativo son no menos importante que todo lo otro que se está desarrollando en esos lugares. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Eduardo. I think um, it was a tour de force. It was a, there was a lot of information and many, many points to, to, to consider within your presentation. I really like many of the practical uh, suggestions that you have um, um, put out there. So thank you so much. And I think hopefully we'll have some time for some questions and, and um, further clarification. So um, we move on to our, our final um, speaker for, for today. Um, Julie is going to talk about the um, health of care in Europe, um, the um, facing uh, unexpected challenges um, in the development of health of care. So, Julie, um, over to you. So, I'll just wait for my slides. Can everybody? Oh, oh, yeah, that's it. So, I'll just wait for my slides. Um, I can see lots of people, and I'm really envious because you obviously all speak Spanish and English, whereas I have to sit with my headphones on. So, um, well done on all of that. And. Um, I suppose I'm, I'm here in two roles. The first is um, that I am CEO of the European Association for Palliative Care. So that's a membership organization, uh, 55, uh, 55 organizations from 33 countries. Australia and New Zealand have joined us, so it's a bit like the Eurovision Song Contest. They're not really in Europe, but they're still part of the European Association. Um, and I was also, for the last year, I've worked as a consultant for the WHO Europe. So that represents 53 countries from Ireland, where I live, very rainy, very cold, right across to Central Asia, to Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Azerbaijan. So you can imagine that some of the things Eduardo spoke about regarding, um, and, and even Emmanuel, about language and being able to translate palliative care and how that looks across that whole region is very, very difficult. Um, so this is going to be an amalgamation of both of those roles, so it's not, I'm not always speaking on behalf of the WHO, but certainly I'm including some things there. And I suppose I should congratulate Atlantis because you are in a very exclusive club of two um, organisations within the WHO Europe who are uh, palliative care collaborating centres, so well done on that. So that's, um, now I've got a little thing here, so, okay. So, second picture of Dame Sicily, so I'm sorry about that, but I was going to say something slightly different. Um, and what I was going to say is that actually in Europe we're very lucky because actually Europe is seen as the founding, uh, the, the, the founding um, continent for palliative care. And Dame Sicily was the foundress of the modern hospice movement in the 1960s. Um, she also did something which was really important. She's a doctor, she's a nurse, and she's a social worker, or was. And so she was almost a, a one-woman multidisciplinary team. And I think in palliative care, that's something that we should um, embrace wholly. And she also spoke about um, total pain and holistic care for the first time. So no longer were people being looked at as their disease or as a symptom or a treatment, but really looking at the psychosocial, spiritual, and the physical symptoms. So that was a really big revolution um, and one that we've continued. And her work really has been the basis for palliative care development across Europe. And that happened in the, the 80s, 90s, and is continuing even now. Um, I've got some really bad news for all of you, and that is that um, it's something I was talking about at lunchtime, actually, um, is that we're all going to die. So I'm seeing lots of young people at the back, and you probably are thinking it's a long, long way off. But I think if we start with that premise in palliative care, we're all going to die. But dying well is something that most people don't do. And in a recent global ranking of palliative care services and quality of death across the world, so there were 81 countries in this, it's published in the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management earlier this year. Um, the top two countries were the UK and Ireland for palliative care and ranked on a range of uh, various um, structures. So for example, did you have a national policy? Is palliative care integrated? 
but still the biggest source of complaints to healthcare service ombudsmen, so when you want to make a complaint, is about end of life care and death and dying in those two countries. So somewhere along the line, even if your country is ranked really highly as providing very good palliative care, at the end of the day, even within those countries, there's huge variation. And I would imagine, I think uh, you spoke about it in Spain, and I think that that's something that, you know, it depends on where you live, it depends on whether you're rural, whether you're urban, and even within cities, and whether you're rich, whether you're poor, there's so many factors that impact on whether you actually get good end-of-life care. And I think we can probably all agree that dying well is a human right, but how do we manage that? And so we still have plenty more work to do. And this was the, the WHA resolution, which Char Mary Charlotte mentioned earlier. And this really has been um, the catalyst for a lot of change and development. And particularly in countries where perhaps um, palliative care services have not been as well developed, um, this has been something that people have used to advocate for better services. So strengthening palliative care, um, having access to essential medicines to control your pain and symptoms and other things. So I, I think we're now eight years since this was published, but we're, not, we're starting to see a lot of that. And in the European region, I really see a lot of my work has been with countries in um, the former Soviet states, so the CIS countries, Caucasus, Eastern Europe, and certainly there, many of these countries would see this document as a really, really key part of helping to develop their palliative care services. So this is from Palliative Care Europe. So even all this time after the resolution and after palliative care has been developed, we're still being called to action that in Europe we still have a lot of people who are, who are not receiving palliative care. People who it's disease dependent, obviously, you will know that palliative care started with oncology in many countries, and so it's often still closely aligned with people with cancer. Um, I was reading today, the, the EAPC has a, a blog which we publish twice a week, and I, and I was reading the blog from today, and it's talking about research in palliative care and the general perception of that from the public. And the quote was something along the lines, and maybe I, I haven't got it exactly right, but it's um, the researcher was asked um, about palliative care in Denmark and said, you know, why would people not take palliative care rehabilitation? And she said, because the word palliative has the cloud of death hanging over it. So I think we still have a lot of work to do. So palliative care for everybody across the lifespan, these are all key messages from the WHA resolution that we in WHO Europe are still promoting. Um, and for all of you in Atlantis, this is a, probably a, a very good advert because the EAPC Atlas of Palliative Care in Europe, which has charted the development of palliative care across many years. So the first was in 2007, and you can see the covers here up to 2019. And they've all been um, EAPC publications, but the work has been led by Carlos Sengeno, and we're very grateful for his help with that. And you can see that in this paper, he looked at those 51 countries and um, across 51 countries. Some of them we still don't get data from, but we're trying. Uh, and you can see, if you read this paper, that actually there has been a lot of development, but there's also a lot of places where there still needs to be a lot of work. So the big, big circles are where palliative care services are reported to be very well developed. And as you can see, the further east you go, the less likely you are to have palliative care services available to you. Um, and that's one of the things we're working on a lot in the WHO office in um, Europe, is working with those countries. And I was recently at a meeting with, the, um, with um, representatives from the WHO from those countries, and I was asking them about palliative care, and they said that, that people are cared for at home by their families, that there is very, uh, there's no access to palliative care in many of the countries. And, and I asked about, well, when you go home, does someone support your family? And they said, no, they don't get support in the community. And that sometimes even getting drugs to manage symptoms, which would, in many Western European countries would be very simple. So, for example, access to opioids, that 
in many of those countries still, even if the law says you can prescribe them, actually accessing them in a local pharmacy can be really, really troublesome and difficult. So even, even where some of the principles of the World Health Resolution have got through, that still the practical realities on the ground in many of those countries is that your family will care for you at home and that you may well not have any pain or symptom management in the community, which I think, so obviously we still have a lot to do. And as I said, even where the circles are big and palliative care services are developed, well developed, we still need to do a lot of work. So it's good and bad news, not all bad news. So in life, we always have to expect the unexpected. And I think probably if I had been standing here giving this talk in 2018, 2019, it would have probably been very different. And I think none of us could have imagined a few things that have happened over the last few years. Who would have thought? Donald Trump, Boris Johnson. And then we end up with um, early in 2020, people talking about Wuhan and what was going on there. And I think if we think back to that time, it's almost, I, I almost get muddled up over the, the time period, but certainly for palliative care, it was a very difficult time because I think to start with, people were very disbelieving and weren't, it wasn't that we doubted, but we just weren't sure how it was going to impact on us. So it was almost like in Europe, we're expecting the unexpected. So two things in the last two years, and I think um, there's a lot of... Um, analogies, war and battles and so on. And one was the battle for, about uh, COVID and coronavirus. And then the other again is something that was un unimaginable, or was it? I think I'll come back to that, um, was that there would be a war in Europe that would impact on all of us. So uh, what does that mean for palliative care? So we're thinking back, the 11th of March was that day. I mean, I don't know if anybody remembers it, as being that day, but that was, that was the day that the pandemic was um, named. And then I was just looking at this the other day as I was preparing this talk, and when you look at the John Hopkins, and I appreciate that this is the best data available, and that in many countries perhaps they don't have data to report, um, so when there's no big red dots on countries, it doesn't mean that that there has been no COVID um, impact in those countries, it just means it hasn't been reported or, as you can see, the real hotspot was Europe. And, and if you look at the total number of deaths, and um, I suppose one of my abiding memories is the, the almost, uh, the fight to get a vaccine for yourself. Everyone was, was really panicking. It was, it was a very difficult time. And I think these were pictures we never thought we would see in a European context. And I mean, who would forget the military trucks queuing up in the northern part of Italy um, to, to, uh, to take people to a mortuary? I think it was something that, that just always sticks with me. And again, the picture of the coffins in, 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 in northern Italy too. The fact that healthcare professionals would have to wear a photo of themselves on the front of their PPE so that people could see who was behind the mask and the impact that that had on, on the delivery of care to everybody, not just people requiring palliative care, not being able to visit a relative and having to look through windows. It's not that long since we did it, but when you think of the time frame, things have changed. And then there was this absolute desperate urgency for people to have information. And I remember um, that there was... Um, all the journals in palliative care were saying, let's get articles out. They had a quick review system. We all know as anyone working in healthcare or that, that there's this whole process of having to go through academic review, but actually people were publishing things because there was this absolute hunger for information about how to treat symptoms. And, and, and in palliative care, we had information that perhaps our colleagues in other areas of healthcare didn't have, how would we manage those really troublesome symptoms of COVID? So acute dyspnea and, and, and uh, you know, how, how did we manage that in palliative care? And so our, our knowledge was really transferable. And I remember the blog, this, this blog about Bologna and the healthcare, one of our board members wrote it, and it's still our highest viewed blog by thousands because people were just so desperate to get information. Um, so end of life care. So for palliative care it was disastrous and I know Eduardo was talking about phone calls to uh, patients and their families but 
I, I, I think, you know, the, the, the idea of an older person dying in hospital and having to see their family member on an iPad. People, if, if you were lucky, there were iPads. And I remember even there was a scramble to get those. And everyone caring for you, um, wearing uh, extensive PPE. And, and if they could get it, there was even times when that wasn't possible. So, you, you know, for relatives, being able to actually visit and be with their families had been a huge issue. And still, to this day, is in some countries where public health and palliative care are not aligned. And I think that's an issue. Saying goodbye, how did people say goodbye? There was a very sweet little story about people, um, they asked people to knit hearts and two of them and the nurse who was with the patient gave one to the person who was dying and the other one to the family member to say that they'd been with them and that was going viral on social media again, another place that everyone was getting their information. So death and bereavement, body bags, people, I, I live in Ireland, so the wake is still a really important part of rituals for death and bereavement, and yet people were um, in a body bag and their coffins were closed, and we had a limit of six people at funerals, and in Ireland they're usually 6,000, many, many, um, you know, churches uh, and services were really difficult. The priests, uh, many of the priests were old and they weren't able to do the services because they were worried about getting COVID, so it was all online and it was very difficult. Um, so, and bereavement care, I believe, is going to be one of our biggest issues in palliative care, having to deal with the aftermath of people um, not being able to be at the death of their loved one is such a huge issue. Um, and then, as if, uh, just as the, the, the pandemic seemed to be coming to an end, lots of people had been vaccinated. I don't talk for the whole of Europe. In many of the countries in CIS, there's very, very low vaccination rates and, um, uh, and, and still are. And Ukraine is one of those countries where there's very, very low vaccination rates. But then just along came a war. So was it a surprise? Um, Crimea, you know, that was uh, eight years ago that um, Russia invaded Crimea, but could anyone have predicted this was going to happen? And then there was all the news stories. So it was um, the biggest event. So U Ukraine, I had been in Ukraine in um, November of 2019, giving a talk in Lviv. And um, they were really trying to build palliative care. I visited a hospice there. And um, it wouldn't have been probably what we would see here in Western Europe uh, and Southern Europe, but certainly um, the enthusiasm and the commitment was huge to developing palliative care. Um, when the war started, um, the person who had invited me to speak contacted me on Facebook and was asking me, can you help, can you send us resources, can you get messages out? It's, it was um, a really, really difficult time. And I think um, one of the ways that we tried to help in the APC was we, we tried to get their people's messages out. So from Lviv um, and, and from Kiev and um, from the children's palliative care team, uh, and we tried to get their stories. And although we couldn't financially help, we would um, put their blogs out to people and put them in contact with people who could. So this is the immediate aftermath. And, and this was in the first few weeks, there were uh, many meetings to try and organize how we could help. From the WHO perspective in the European region, um, it was the first time in um, only the second time in the whole history of the WHO European office that an extraordinary meeting was called by 43 of the 53 member states to talk about health care in Ukraine and how that could, the WHO could respond. So um, this article was published in The Lancet in April this year and as you can see it's like talking about palliative care and humanitarian crisis that um, palliative care services have been hugely impacted, not only because the staff aren't there, many of the staff have been recruited to fight in the war, who have, um, some of them have been killed, and uh, some of them have fled the country. So the health services that are available are severely impacted. It's, it's beyond our imagination, but I think we do need to think about what we can do and how we can help. Um, so 
I think for, for the palliative care community, in some ways, many of the staff have also been moved to acute settings to deal with military injuries. So the hospital in Lviv that was a hospice when I was there, all of the patients were moved out and it became a military hospital to deal with all the injuries and still is. And when I was talking to um, the girl in Lviv, she was telling me that, um, you know, there's, because all of the young have left, mass emigration, that there's nobody to care for the palliative care patients at home. So there's all of these issues. And this was in the very, very early stages. So as you can see, the impact again, this is about cancer provision and about um, that the, the palliative care units are working, but that it's really, really difficult. And the patients are moved into basements and caring is really hard and supplies are very difficult to come by, particularly in the Eastern region. Um, I know one um, hospice sent, um, dro drove across Poland and um, from the UK and dropped supplies off actually in Poland and then they picked them up and moved them over but just even the logistics of all of that for palliative care is very very difficult and also is palliative care a priority it's a question which I don't know the answer to but if you're trying to save soldiers who are young and who've had major surgery and trauma uh, and you're moving your healthcare staff to look after them, who's caring for the patients who need palliative care. So you can see this was the migration map um, during the first part of the war, and you can see huge numbers of people cross the border, some of them to Russia as well. Palliative care colleagues from Moscow spoke to me and told me that they had driven to the border to help any patients who needed palliative care and that they were providing care to them in Russia but mainly from a European perspective. People moved to Poland, to Romania, to Warsaw, um, and, and Poland took most. But if we talk to our palliative care colleagues from those countries, so for example, in Romania, they were already suffering. They already, because of the, because of the pandemic, they already had very, very severe um, restrictions on the, the care they could give. And then to take children for palliative care and across the border, which they did. Um, Germany took um, a huge number of refugees and a lot of sick children. So the Children's Hospital in Munich, the palliative care team took children as well. So people did take a lot of, uh, of different people if they could, and that was the way that the community responded. But I think recent figures show that a lot of Ukrainians who left are going back to Ukraine, particularly if they live in the West because they don't see that the conflict is still there. Um, and, and many of them are returning. So that's a, a, another issue, again, for supplies and for of, of all descriptions. So ongoing healthcare. So in Ukraine, you can see this was a paper that was um, published again in The Lancet in April, and it says that 10,000 people have been left, and a lot of those needed care. Infectious disease outbreaks are huge. As I said, a lot of people have not been vaccinated for COVID, and then other conditions um, and communicable diseases are rife. Healthcare worker shortages, people injured or killed or have fled. It seems impossible that we're talking about that, but it's a fact that there's medication and food shortages locally and the wider impact. So if you need opioids for pain control um, at the end of life, many of those are going to military hospitals to care for people post-operatively. Um, and then the, the wider reach and the wider impact for our health services as time goes on. You know, the, the, it says here that people leaving war zones take trauma with them and this will be something that we will deal with for many, many years to come. Um, also the impact on neighbouring countries I spoke about. Um, also this I think was mentioned earlier as well that the poor are the most likely to be impacted and not only in Ukraine but we know about you know the food chain, the fuel, all of those things so that's all going to impact on the people we care for in countries far from Ukraine. Um, and as you can see, this was from the same article in, in The Lancet saying that for each person killed directly by war, nine will be killed indirectly um, through the health effects and, and other impacts of war. So I think it's something for, the Euro for Europe to think about. And, and um, I think I don't have answers, by the way, that a lot of these things are questions. 
I looked at some other situations such as Syria um, and Yemen and, and there's questions in some of the articles I read about, well, why do we care more what happens in Ukraine than we care what has happened in other countries and what can we do? Um, there's recently been a declaration of Rome for children's palliative care for, in Ukraine. Um, Palchase are an organisation that look at palliative care in humanitarian situations and um, you might want to look at their website if you're interested in this particular area. Um, so this is, these are both humanitarian emergencies and palliative care and symptom control should be a part of those. Um, and this is the quote, the responses that don't include palliative care are medically deficient and, and ethically indefensible. But I think as a palliative care community, we have to think about how we can help because um, the, the acute needs in, in Ukraine are as such that it's maybe not palliative care is their priority, but we still need to be there. And I think as a, as a, as a community, I think that for many years to come, we will have to offer our help and offer to be available. Um, we need to, to, to respond in any way we can. I don't mean financially, because many, many people don't have that opportunity to be able to help financially, but certainly um, by way of education, teaching, um, and by way of even exchange programs, bring people from Ukraine, training them. Uh, that was something be even before the war that was a, they were really hoping for. They even asked me if you have spare e medical equipment anywhere, could you send it to us? And you know, just help in any way we can. Um, I just wanted to show you these other publications because. Um, I know we're here and we were talking about the indicators, worldwide indicators, but I think some of the topics I've spoken about are very different to the others. Um, but again, um, these are all available on the WHO website. And I think for my final thoughts is, palliative care community, we are compassionate and we have so much to offer and give. And I think we need to do that to um, our colleagues in not just Ukraine, but even in countries further afield, making our education uh, educational information available and again you know if we can get it translated into Russian many people can read that and helping to develop palliative care services across the whole European region and um, that's it so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much Julie. I think that's that's been a wonderful presentation by all three speakers. I don't think we have um, that much time, um, but we'll, I think there is a little bit of time for a few questions. So um, I'll pose a couple of questions to each of you. Um, Emmanuel, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great, Emmanuel. I, I'm very struck by your presentation, especially the issue of, of um, the uh, aspects of poverty um, and, and the challenges of healthcare financing in, in Africa and, and many of the problems that you face over there. Given that you know, the, the, the world is undergoing a lot more um, challenging crisis in, 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 in economic um, terms and, and other aspects, how do we ensure that palliative care doesn't get completely ignored um, by governments and policymakers? And, and, and that there is still continuing provision, not just provision, but enhancement of the various programs that you see in, in Africa. Um, uh, thank you very much, Ednin. Um, definitely we need to uh, take the issue of financing for palliative care very seriously uh, as part of the wider health financing and of course bearing in mind that out-of-pocket costs are either killing or impoverishing families. And uh, we, there is already some work that has been done that we can build on. We know when the Lancet Commission um, on Access to Palliative Care and Pain Medicine report was published, they were very clear uh, there was clear content on the package that needs to be included for universal health coverage. And that package has the aspect of uh, personnel, it has the aspect of essential medicines and, and technologies and uh, um, devices for patients, as well as the other 
psychosocial components. And uh, what we've done within the African context is to, uh, to de further redefine that package, build on it, and then we shared it with the ministers of health the last time we had the ministers of health session on palliative care. And we've now piloted it in Kenya to see how that can be integrated within the universal health coverage packages. The next step for us, therefore, is to engage governments and ensure that that palliative care package is considered part and parcel of all their universal health coverage packages and efforts. In that way, we will then reduce the risk that patients face uh, when they are caught between illness and poverty. And somebody needs to take that responsibility to provide for that. And that has to be the taxman. Because by the time you need palliative care services in the African context, you are so vulnerable. In most cases, you've used all the money you had, you've sold all the cows you had, you've borrowed from all the people who can lend you. And therefore, it is important for us as palliative care providers, advocates, and experts to continuously engage with governments, especially in the low and middle income countries, to ensure that we do not drop palliative care in all the health care efforts that are pushed forward. Ednin? Yes. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. He's still there. Oh, he's behind us. I'm, I'm behind you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, Eduardo, I think that I was struck by the various examples that you talked about to enhance uh, palliative care delivery um, in, in the hospital setting, and especially the area of, of integrating sort of communication, both technology and, and directly in patient-centered care. But finally, I think that what struck me was the, the various suggestions that you have and the evidence that you, support, that you provided to support that. So my, my question would then be, you know, research is an integral part that would inform us as to whether an intervention would be useful or not useful. Um, and it, it, it is incredibly helpful. So one of the issues that affects many of us in, in different countries is the lack of research, uh, lack of resources for research um, how do you encourage um, research to be conducted and further funding to be provided for research because we need that evidence to provide better care? Thanks very much, Ed. One of the wonderful parts we have in, in, in you know, the, the silver linings of a catastrophic approach that medical schools, universities and hospitals have taken to suffering is that we can address a lot of issues with paper and pencil or with a calculator. And therefore, uh, sometimes the reason why uh, some of the research is not being done is because people don't feel safe, they don't feel comfortable, they need some mentorship, they need to be given confidence. And I do that frequently with colleagues from, uh, from different areas in the world, and, and they're doing fantastic jobs, very innovative, very original, using resources that are there and that in the United States you cannot do many new things at all unless the company is involved. In fact, the FDA wouldn't even take an application from Brera. They would need Brera to find a, a sponsor to go to them and, and make the application. In other areas of the world, people are doing those things, and so sometimes the challenge is to provide those colleagues with the mentorship and the confidence to uh, collect the data, to analyze it, maybe some statistical support, helping them to write those abstracts and then send them uh, to meetings. And even, uh, they don't even have to travel. They can many times participate um, uh, virtually. And we can do this mentorship the way we're having this conference right now. So COVID brought a lot of developments. And I'm optimistic that those working in the developing world, if they're able to devote a little bit of their time, that is the valuable commodity, that is to uh, say, uh, if, if I see three more patients today, I will deal with these three patients. But you see, if instead of that, I collect the data, I might help thousands of patients later on. So that harmony in your day time or in your week time 
between the urgent and the important so that you take that time to collect a little bit of data, to do a little bit of that, of that writing is what I think we, that, that's where the great opportunity lies. And many of us uh, in this meeting and so on can take on uh, mentoring uh, people who are uh, motivated and working in places that are doing interesting things so that you have uh, very, very uh, culturally applicable uh, clinical trials, research, survey methodology uh, being done everywhere. I, uh, I believe also we need to do research, very strong research into what's wrong with the deans, what's wrong with the ministers of health. Uh, why are they failing to understand that their mother suffered, that their father suffered, and that they are going to suffer? And why are they failing to say, maybe we should know a little bit better about how to deliver healthcare to them? And I think uh, that needs profound methodologies, fMRIs, I don't know what type of methodology, but the narcissism of our leaders needs to be addressed in some way to see how we can uh, get to them, how we can get to them and motivate them to uh, harmonize persons with diseases. I look forward to that paper, um, Eduardo. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll be a wonderful read. Um, finally, Julie, I think it's, it's, it's very heartbreaking to hear the various stories that's coming out of Europe. Um, so I guess my, my question would then be how do we get to, how do we get their voices heard and how do we get the policy makers and leaders to address their suffering um, so that they that some of it can be alleviated within within the current situation and and finally as a follow-up question is that i mean you hold several positions what could the various international palliative care communities do to assist in, in speeding up the process of of further developing palliative care so that it will become part of universal health care in all settings? I think the same, can you hear me, yes? This is like being Beyonce or something. Um, I think uh, if, um, I think one of the, it, it's almost like a very slow process, so working with each individual country and working with their policies, and when, in the WHO Europe, we've been invited into several countries and it's even very simple things like people telling me they're going to build a 50-bedded hospice in the middle of a country where there is no palliative care because they think that that's the answer. So I think it is getting the information out and being there at the table. And that's what I've loved so much about the last year is being a part of, of an organisation where uh, the WHO can make that... People will listen and, uh, and I think you can make that difference. I think... It's a long process. Think how long it's taken us from Dame Sicily in 67 all the way through, and we're still not there. So, um, and, and I know the WHO is committed to that, and I know Mary Charlotte will, will confirm that, that, that they're committed to strengthening palliative care. She may even have a better answer than mine on how you would develop more. But certainly, I, I'm working with different countries at the moment on policies and providing them with documents and we had a technical briefing with all the ministries of health last year so it's bringing together the right people who can make that change we know from carlos's indicators we need a policy we need um we need integration of care we need essential medicines so it's almost telling you know we have that now to give to people and tell them this is what we need so I think, I think that's been really helpful. As, a, as a, a global palliative care community, I know there have been so many humanitarian crises, and, and I, I know it's not just in Europe. Um, I suppose it's just at the forefront of our minds at the moment, and that we do need help. But certainly, I think, you know, the way for palliative care to improve for everybody is through education. I'm sure Eduardo will back that 100% that we, we need education. It starts with that and we need to be able to provide information in a format that people can understand and I think you know all of us have our own curricula and we keep them and, and all this. it's just making things available to people so they understand and can develop services and I think we have to be available and I, I said this 
that we, I think at the moment, if you said, let's go into Ukraine and talk about palliative care, we can help on, a, on, on certain ways, but to, to, at this exact moment, their focus is not on palliative care. And, and, and we need to be there when that focus switches, I think. Mary Charlotte, have you got a better answer? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, but I think the people who could get, um, help us to give a better answer are uh, the, the patient and the family themselves. So engaging uh, people in this uh, discussion is, is uh, very important, um, as usual in public health, but, but maybe particularly in uh, this, this specific area of palliative care because of the complexity of needs. And, and we, we can't have um, a simple answer to uh, so complex uh, uh, needs. I think <coughs> it's, it's also something um, which can change over time. So we, we really have to be um, very open to, uh, to different kind of uh, request and, and uh, ensure that the people we serve are part of this conversation, mm -hmm. part of the, uh, the evaluation, the monitoring of what we do also. And we start to talk about death and dying. We start to talk about it. Instead of watching people having plastic surgery and looking young all the time, we need to think about that people do die, and dying well is a human right. It's my mantra. It's everybody's mantra, I know. But I think that's something we in palliative care need to involve the public and communities, and I think that's a really big issue. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, uh, Emmanuel. Thank you, Eduardo. And thank you, Mary Charlotte, for sharing this uh, platform with me. I think it's been a wonderful symposium. We've gone a little bit over time, but I want to leave the final word to Professor Carlos Santano, who's um, not being there at the moment. But um, Carlos, um, I think the final word belongs to you. Thank you. Muy buenas tardes. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Gracias, Ernin. Gracias también por tu generosidad siempre de estar en la distancia desde Malasia, eh, coordinando también eh, este panel. Eh, mi, mis palabras brevísimas son, en primer lugar, para agradecer a la Fundación, en eh, la persona de, de Raimundo Pérez Hernández, su, su generosidad cediendo su sede y ayudándonos tanto en la organización, a, a la organización eh, de los profesionales españoles, la SECPAL, por en la persona de aquí, ya por, por estar ahí presentes avalando el simposio y, y cómo no, pues a Paloma Grau, nuestra vice, vice rectora, por, por haberse desplazado hasta Madrid para inaugurar el simposio. ¿no? Eh, Mari Charlón nos ha recordado que el compromiso de la Organización Mundial de la Salud por ayudarnos a todos a construir la casa de cuidados paliativos. Quiere ayudar a la Organización Mundial de la Salud a que cada país construya su casa. Y nos ha dado ya algunos elementos de cómo se construye eh, esa casa. Eh, lo avalas con tus palabras, pero lo, lo avalas también con tu presencia y con la organización de, de este simposio. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, este panel era sobre retos y hemos hablado de los muchos retos que hay en África, eh, doctor Emanuel de los muchos retos que hay en África, pero tenemos un reto común, que, que es el de la educación. Educación para todos los profesionales, los futuros profesionales y los actuales profesionales. Creo que, que ese es el primer reto del que estamos hablando hoy, el reto de, de la educación. ¿no? El reto de la academia. ¿eh? Hemos nacido fuera del hecho matrimonial, decía Bruera. Eh, pues eh, lo que pasa es que, que Bruera demuestra que para entrar en la academia, eh, quizá su investigación lo pondrá de manifiesto, pero para entrar en la academia, eh, usted, tú, lo has conseguido por medio del rigor, de los resultados, con ciencia y con investigación. Puede haber otras maneras de estar en la academia, pero los resultados que tú muestras es que se puede entrar en la academia desde fuera eh, con estas armas. Y gracias, Julie Ging, que, que llega a España después de un complicado viaje por, por estar con nosotros, acompañándonos desde la Oficina Europea de la OMS, 
y desde la Sociedad Europea de Cuidados Paliativos y haciéndonos presentes que también en, en Europa tenemos necesidad de las crisis humanitarias, ¿no? de cuidados paliativos en las crisis humanitarias. Y nos recuerdas que no solo la guerra es una crisis humanitaria, sino que también tantas migraciones y la pandemia han puesto de manifiesto la necesidad de los cuidados paliativos. Gracias a todos por estar con nosotros, gracias especialmente a todos los compañeros de Latinoamérica que nos siguen desde sus países a primeras horas de la mañana y, y por mi parte nada más. ¿no? Eh, agradezco, ¿no? es un problema de salud menor por el cual no puedo estar acompañándonos, pero espero pronto estar al 100% para seguir trabajando por todos nosotros. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Carlos, porque es muy importante tener este mensaje tuyo con, con nosotros. Eh, yo creo que podríamos tener un par de minutos para eh, algunas preguntas, si, si hay en esta sala, yo creo que eh, no, no es factible tomar eh, preguntas de, eh, fuera de, de esta sala por las personas eh, conectadas, pero si eh, hay preguntas... En esta sala, eh, por favor, levanten la mano y hay eh, micrófonos. Eh, si no, eh, yo creo que hay un break de algunos minutos ahora y seguiremos con el segundo panel a las seis y media hora de Madrid, eh, o sea, en más o menos 15 minutos. Eh, entonces, eh, no veo ninguna, ninguna pregunta en, ese, en la sala, así que nos encontramos en 15 minutos. Y muchas gracias a nuestros panelistas.